Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our, this is, I think, our third time we've, we've done a Twitch stream for um, uh, for our NRE, NRE Labs project. I'm Derek Winkworth, um, Cloud Toad on Twitter. I am the community manager for NRE Labs. Uh, I have on today uh, Matt Oswalt, otherwise known as Mirdin, M-I-E-R-D-I-N, on Twitter. Uh, feel free to follow him and myself if you want. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some significant changes we made to a piece of NRE Labs, a tool that, uh, that, that makes it very easy to write lessons for NRE Labs, to go, to go through the process of creating lessons for NRE Labs, uh, called Self-Medicate. Um, I just want to say uh, sorry for the lighting. I'm, I'm in a quiet room um, in a building somewhere, so I don't have the best lighting. He's being interrogated by the KGB. Yeah, right now. They're on the other side of my laptop right now telling me what to say. Um, <laughs> that would be that would be the not the worst thing that's happened to me in the last month. So uh, if so, so uh, having kicked that off, I, I guess um, we'll do some boil, boilerplate, I guess. NRE Labs is a uh, is an open source uh, project sponsored by uh, Juniper Networks, but it's it's not a product uh, of Juniper Networks. Um, it's a way for it's for network engineers to get familiar with automation concepts that they're going to run into if they start using, you know, popular um, automation related tooling out on the on the interwebs that they can download um, and and get familiar with. Um, it's completely uh, what is that marketing wall free? You don't have to register at at all on the website. You can just go there, click on a lesson, and it instantly launches a uh, a sandbox just for you without knowing anything about you, so that you can start learning um, without worrying about you know being being targeted in some kind of nefarious marketing plan. Uh, so so I highly recommend going there. It's uh, labs dot dot engineering. Um, all lowercase, um, spelled exactly as it sounds. So um, you can also follow NRE Labs on Twitter for the latest updates on what's going on with the project. Um, it's just at NRE Labs. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Matt. Yeah, cool. So yeah, kind of like what Derek was saying, we the purpose of, of this is not to, you know, to to go rah-rah Juniper. It's, it's really like the, dis, the disconnect we saw in the industry was that there was all, all you know, the, the small group of folks that were automating and they knew a lot about the various tools and processes. And then you have, you have, you have folks that, you know, don't really know much about automation and the, the, the way that those two groups like shared information just wasn't super great. Like at the, in the best case scenario, you'd have some of the automation savvy folks writing blog posts and GitHub URLs and things like that. Um, but the people that didn't know anything about automation wouldn't really feel like they had the skills to even consume the tutorials. <laughs> like there's just a huge, a huge disconnect there. And so we wanted to build a platform that allowed folks who already have some expertise. And that's said, of course, that's going to come in varying degrees, but let's say you have uh, some expertise with an automation tool um, or maybe a particular process or something like that. And you want to be able to share that information in a way that's very easily consumable. Um, like I mentioned in the past, this wasn't super possible. You'd have to like write a blog post and just hope that the reader kind of understands where, where you're coming from, but that's not very interactive. Uh, and then on the other hand, like some people, and I've, I'm, I'm guilty of this where some people, uh, who have say a lot of experience with Ansible, they'll set up a GitHub repository with a whole bunch of scripts in it that set things up and run through tutorials and things like that. But in, in most cases, you have to actually kind of know a lot about automation already in order to consume that. So we have this balancing act that we want to play between interactivity. A lot of us like to learn by doing. And then on the other side of the fence, we have the ease of use that uh, comes intuitively with a blog post. You don't need to know anything to read a blog post. So with NRE Labs, what we wanted to do is build a platform that took the strengths of both. And so we've constructed a, the way that we've constructed the software is such that you can contribute to this curriculum um, in a way that when that curriculum is consumed, the person that's using it doesn't need to know anything. Um, and so our goal for this for this particular community episode is actually to show how you can do exactly that. Um, we've developed a, a sort of a child project or a sister project to some of the other software we've created, and we call it Self Medicate. What Self Medicate really is is a, it's a it's a it's a way of running the same software that we run the production site um, all on your laptop. 
the benefit of that is you can uh, create curricula um, locally on your laptop in, in your own text editor and test it uh, all on your laptop. Again, fully in the browser, but the actual content is running on your laptop and not anywhere else, like not in our cloud or anything like that. The cool thing about that is you can use that as sort of your development environment. If you even, regardless of whether or not you want to contribute that content eventually to NRE Labs, you have this local environment to, to test that content out in. And then, you know, once you've gotten it to a certain point, maybe you think about contributing it. And so this is one of the things that we really wanted to do to make sure people felt like their path to being able to contribute their automation expertise was as, uh, had, had as low a barrier to entry as possible. So that is the motivation behind this. Um, like I said, all self-medicate is, is a set of uh, scripts that allows, uh, that, that allows you to run the exact same software on your laptop in a smaller scale that we do in production to power the full NRE Labs experience. So uh, my, what I'd like to do in the next, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes is outline what we've built to enable that. Now, if you've been around for a while, uh, self-medicate, you, you probably actually have, have heard that for a while. We actually released self-medicate alongside the original release of NRE Labs. But there, there were a few problems with it. And as the software uh, moved forward with a whole bunch of different features, um, it, was, it was difficult to keep the two in sync. And so one of the things that we've done recently was um, invest a lot of time into making the self-medicate experience a lot more intuitive. Um, for instance, if you didn't know anything uh, about Kubernetes, uh, you then you you wouldn't really have the tools to know how to troubleshoot what's going wrong on the self-medicate experience. And sometimes things would go wrong. Um, or even not necessarily things go wrong, um, uh, one of the steps inside of the self-medicate script is when you, when you spin up a new lesson, it has to download all of the images in that lesson. Now, when we're running, when we're running the, the software in the cloud, the bandwidth is limitless, effectively, so it takes almost no time. But if you're running this on your laptop on Wi-Fi, um, downloading hundreds of megabytes or potentially gigabytes of images just before you even bother getting the lesson spun up, that takes a long time. And so the, the, uh, what it looked like to somebody that, again, didn't really know what's going on behind the scenes is it just looked like nothing was working, even though there was a download taking place. So one of the things that we did was we, we, we built logic into the self-medicate experience that made that a lot more obvious. So two things, we added visibility into that process so you know a lot more about what's going on behind the scenes um, from self-medicate. When you execute self-medicate, it'll tell you much more about what's going on. And in addition, uh, it'll also preemptively download some of those large, uh, those large images. For instance, the VQFX images um, are fairly large and they're pretty much needed by any lesson, at least the lessons that are there right now. So uh, the self-medicate script will actually download those ahead of time. And again, it'll tell you what it's doing and it'll tell you how long it's taking. Um, the benefit to that is once you, have the, uh, once you have the environment spun up and all of that's finished, when you start a lesson, it'll happen much more quickly because it doesn't have to download the images at that point, it's all done. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and I will walk through the, uh, the self-medicate repository and the output of uh, the script when we, re when we uh, actually run it. So if we go to, uh, so I, I just have a terminal open. <clears throat> and as, as you can see, uh, we have the self-medicate.sh script. This is just in the antidote self-medicate uh, repository. We'll put a link uh, to that in the chat. That way you can see uh, where that's at. But it's at, it's, uh, at nre-learning uh, slash antidote hyphen self-medicate. So if you, if you go to that repo and you clone it, you'll see that there's really just one script in the directory. In fact, I'll just navigate to that right now. Uh, you can see that we've, we've also reorganized things a little bit better. Um, every, all of the Kubernetes-esque things that you saw maybe before, if you if you've seen this in the past, uh, those are all now in a subdirectory, and you really don't have to mess. You really don't have to mess with them. Um, it used to be this is another change we made recently in self medicate. Uh, it used to be that you'd have to actually manually edit the the uh, uh, the Kubernetes manifests in order to get your code uh, placed or the, your lessons placed within the environment, um, and you actually don't have to do that at all anymore um, because of some of the changes we've made. So. The, all of the Kubernetes stuff that you might have seen before is all in this manifest directory, and you really just don't have to mess with it. Every, you know, you, if something really goes wrong, maybe you could, you know, poke around and see what's in there. But the goal of the self-medicate experience is that that all is abstracted away. Hey, Matt. Yeah, I got a question for you. What is that prompt? That is amazing. Which shell is this? Ah, so the shell is ZSH. Um, I've been using it for about six years, and I love it. Um, 
I can't remember what the name of the theme is. It's some sort of solarized theme. Um, uh, that's uh, with a the... pretty cool looking prompt. That looks like you have a little graphic next to the word Mac changes there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a few things. Uh, the the um, the prompt it shows you where you are uh, in the ZSH sort of abbreviated uh, uh, format. So um, you know these are subdirectories that are abbreviated for for brevity. And then uh, in addition to that, this is my this is the Git plugin. So you can see uh, what directory you're in, what branch you're in. Mac changes is the original name of the branch. Um, and then I, can't, I I kind of know what some of these logos mean, but basically these logos are the status of the Git repository. So if you do Git status. Pretty sure it just means that there's been a few changes. Um, if I were to stage one, let's see, add, self-medicate. Yeah, it looks like there's there's a, a, a plus sign now for anything that's been staged. Anyway, yeah, ZS, ZSH. Um, I use uh, I used to use oh my ZSH, but I moved I moved to ZPresto, so that's that's a, a framework for automatically configuring ZS, ZSH. Um, and my dot files are public. I could send a link in the chat for them if you'd like to poke around at that. Yeah, we'll share that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, my desktop environment is i3, in case you were wondering about that too. Uh, okay. Uh, so, oh yeah, right. So the, uh, the, the okay, right. The, the repository itself, um, and uh, let me actually just show the uh, github.com, entry learning, antidote, self-medicate. So this is the repository. Um, in order to get this, you just clone it. So if you uh, probably use H uh, HTTPS um, and uh, just copy this URL and do a git clone uh, on your local file system and you'll get everything uh, that we have. Now, you might also notice that this branch master, this doesn't show the manifest directory. The reason for that is because these changes aren't actually quite yet merged. So the, the big thing that you want to keep uh, track of is this pull request. Um, uh, you can check out the branch Mac changes like you saw on my terminal if you want to get this stuff right right now, um, but it's not quite merged yet into master. So if you clone the repo right now, you won't get it. Um, you'll have to manually uh, check out this branch. But if you just wait a day or two, you won't have to do any of that. You'll just you you can use master. We'll be merging this very soon. So if you go to the terminal, so uh, selfmedicate.sh. And actually, uh, I can just show some of the code. Um, you can see that there is a, a whole bunch of new subcommands that didn't exist before. Um, and actually, they, the script itself has been renamed. It used to be called anti-up. I, I renamed it to self-medicate. I thought anti-up was cool, but it ended up being a little bit confusing. So self-medicate is the name of the script um, in, in keeping with the name of the repository. And we have a few subcommands. So you'll notice in the output that I saw that I showed before, I ran the subcommand start. So if you're starting out and you just, let's say you initially clone the repo and you haven't done anything yet, start is the first command that you're going to want to run. Um, this, what this will do is it'll spin up a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes. It'll use something called Minikube, which is a way of running a single node instance on your laptop uh, of Kubernetes, which is what uh, NRA Labs runs on top of, or Antidote rather. Uh, and it'll do a whole bunch of automation with respect to uploading all of the infrastructure that you need. So there's additional software that we have to install, like Multis and Weave. Um, then there's things like, you know, we actually have to install the Antidote platform. So Antidote Web and Syringe, those things get installed as well. And then on top of that, we also, like I said, we preemptively install um, the uh, the images, uh, at least not, not all of them, but at least the big, uh, the large and the, the common images, such as the three v, uh, VQFX images, as well as utility. Um, and we can add things here, of course, but these are the ones we have right now. Those all get preemptively downloaded. And then only when all of that is done, you're presented with a message that says, okay, we're ready to go. Here is the URL to access the local environment. So I'll scroll back up and show you that output. Um, the very first thing that you see is this self-medicate.sh, and then again, the subcommand start. And then you'll notice that I'm passing in a, a third parameter, a second, uh, second parameter to the script anyway. Um, and this looks like a directory. So, so dot, dot, slash, antidote. Now this is up a directory, the dot, dot. And then the antidote directory on top of that. So it's a sister directory to where we're at right now. And you might ask, well, why are we doing that? Why are we passing that in? So this is another change that we recently made. It used to be with self-medicate that in order to use any changes that you made, let's say you make uh, uh, curriculum changes, to, uh, you know, you maybe you add a lesson or you modify an existing lesson. The way that you would have to see those changes uh, uh, locally is it, after starting self-medicate, what you'd have to do is you'd have to push all of those changes into a Git repository of your own. 
So usually people would fork the antidote repository, which is where all of our sort of canonical curriculum is stored. Um, if you go uh, out here, this is where our, our existing curriculum is stored, where you see lessons and then all the existing lessons here. So again, like I said, let's say you wanted to add your own lesson. You What you would end up doing is you'd have to fork this repo, and then you'd get your own copy of the antidote repo. <clears throat> you'd make the changes there, and then you'd commit and push them. And then once, and then on top of that, so that's that's something. And then on top of that, once you got that working, you would have to then again manually edit the Kubernetes definitions within the self-medicate repo, which are here. So you'd have to go into the syringe.yml file, and you'd have to change uh, uh, two lines. Actually, you'd have to change this line to indicate uh, your repo instead of the NRE Learning Org. And similarly, you'd have to do the same thing with this line. Um, so a few things there. First off, it had it, it required people to edit Kubernetes manifests, which is a pain, um, especially if you don't know Kubernetes at all. You're just sort of poking through a bunch of random YAML. And in addition, it's a pain because you had to actually commit and push your changes before you could even see them manifested in the local environment, um, which you, which is annoying. So you know people want to be able to just try things and save them and, and reload them instead of deal with you know, adding and push and committing and pushing and then and only then being able to see what your changes are. So we've, we've fixed that in the new version of self-medicate. Um, and the way that we've done that is through file share, uh, folder sharing, directory sharing. So Minikube itself runs inside of a virtual machine. And um, if you scroll up to the start command, and again, I'm showing you behind the scenes here just so that, um, you know, we can poke around. You don't have to do any of this. I'm just showing you how it's actually implemented it. Um, if you look at the script, what it's actually doing is it's mounting the lesson directory that you pass in. So that dot dot slash antidote, we're passing that in at runtime. That gets set to this uh, variable lesson directory. And when we start Minikube, we're passing that in. So that directory, whatever you state, uh, gets uh, uh, mapped to slash antidote inside of the Minikube VM. And then on top of that, whenever we spin up things like syringe, um, those pod definitions are actually uh, using that slash antidote to create host-only volumes. So again, you don't have to deal with any of that. The reason I call that out is because the end result of all of that configuration is that anything that you have local on your file system, and I mean like, for instance, here's the antidote repo. If I make a lesson change here, let's say I edit the, uh, the JSnappy lesson one guide. Let's say I, I type something here and I save that. The way that you can um, actually uh, make that change represented in your local environment is by using the reload command. So if we go to self-medicate again, you can see that there's a, se a second command called reload. And this is really cool. What this does is it really just uh, restarts syringe. That's the only thing it really does. Um, it, for those that uh, know some a little bit about the architecture, syringe is our backend component that does orchestration. And one of the things that it does when it starts initially is it looks at the local file system and says, okay, here's all the lessons. Let me load them all into memory. Now, again, normally what, what happens, and this is true in production, is it actually goes out and it clones a Git repo that it's configured to clone, and then it loads the content that's, that's, that gets pulled locally. But again, dealing with Git when you're just developing uh, content can be a pain. So, so we've, so man, I, yeah. I mean, interrupt, but th this is very cool. I used antidote, um, you know, when, before you could do a local, local directory. Right. Um, yeah. so now you can just take, now I don't now like you said, I don't have to commit to GitHub or anything. I can make all my changes, test everything out locally and then do the commit, um, into a, a repository. Um, so there, yeah. there's, there's two things here I, I was curious about. One is um, you said that this whole thing runs inside of a VM. Do you have to have VirtualBox installed before the, uh, you try to start self-medicate? Yeah, you do. Um, in fact, uh, it's a good point to bring up. Let me uh, bring up the documentation. Um, uh, actually, uh, let me bring up the... Uh, it's not it's not actually uh, published yet because this is also in another uh, pull request. But if you go to um, Antidote Project... Uh, .rtfd.io or read the docs.io and you go to building antidote and you say build and run antidote locally. This is the old version of the docs. Like I said, this is being modified in a pull request as well, but the uh, URL will be the same. Um, so if you go to the docs after we've merged these changes, you'll be able to see um, there's a section that talks about dependencies and there, there actually is already one here. It just, I don't think it talks about uh, VirtualBox. So yeah, you, you do need a, a, a hypervisor installed. I use VirtualBox. It's a pretty common open source hypervisor. So um, use yeah, that. Uh, it there, works there on are a few all other platforms. Options. 
Yeah, exactly. There are a few other options for for um, running Minikube. Minikube is really just a a little orchestrator uh, binary. That's all it is, and it and it, it's not a hypervisor. It's just a configurer, basically. It configures VirtualBox to do what it needs to do. Okay, so you're running Kubernetes and all of these lessons um, um, inside of that virtual machine. So you're doing nested virtualization containers within a VM. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Okay, so earlier you said you added a feature where it would pre-download um, common or large images. You were talking about container images um, for the platform itself running within Kubernetes. Yep. Uh, when when you're developing locally um, and you're introducing a new container image, how does that work? Yeah, that's a good call. So, uh, so not all the images are um, only the one, only the really common one. Um, it's not really possible for us to preemptively download, you know, any image that you might want, unless you feel. And, and, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to show the script is you certainly could go to the self-medicate script and add uh, that image uh, yourself if you wanted to do that. Um, uh, we can't remember where I, where it was. Uh, it's yeah here. So here's the list of images that we download. And like I mentioned before, all of the like the VQFX images, those are extremely common. Pretty much every lesson uses those. Um, so it makes sense to download those ahead of time. Same thing with utility. It's not that big, but it's, again, used by nearly every lesson. So that's the reason we pre-download those. But we don't pre-download everything. Um, and so to your point, if you, if you create a new lesson and you want it to be shown in, in self-medicate, do you need to manually download that image? No, actually, that's not the case. We're just pre-downloading these to make the user experience better um, at runtime. However, when you start a lesson, if the image isn't pulled yet, it will still automatically pull it. It'll just do it sort of just in time as opposed to ahead of time. So that stuff still works. That The ability to automatically pull images that are referenced in the syringe file, all of that's still there. We just added some, um, we just pulled these images ahead of time in the self-medicate script to make the user experience a little better at the, at the you know, at runtime. Okay, sounds good. Cool. So if you um, if you go to the web uh, UI, you'll notice at the end of this it does, uh, it, and you can see these progress bars are all finished. These are the steps that it goes through to get everything spun up. So here's the the progress bar that shows, hey, it says like, hey, I'm installing some basic infrastructure. Um, now I'm installing the Antidote platform. And then these four are the images that we just saw. It'll download those um, in sequence. And then once it's all finished, it'll say, hey, I'm all done. You should be able to access the web UI now. And again, this was a big problem before where, again, people, uh, you know, you know, internet connections can be kind of slow. And so even small images that are required to run Antidote might still be downloading um, at the end of this script getting run. Because again, the self-medicate script before, all it really did is run um, a custom, you know, sort of mini queue command and then upload a bunch of definitions. And immediately after that stuff got uploaded, it would present you with this URL. And so when people would go to that URL right away, like if they didn't, it at all and they went you are right away it actually wouldn't work because things were still being downloaded literally the images for running the web ui and for the back end orchestrator those would still be you know sort of being downloaded so one one of the reasons why we um did all of this uh stuff first where you say like look we're installing the platform it's not ready yet is so that f is so that when we do finally present this url it should actually be working because we've verified that everything is has been downloaded correctly it's part of what the script does So, uh, like I said, if you copy that URL, you should be able to see the web UI, and that's here. So, again, this is exactly the same thing that we see in the production uh, version of the site. It's just running locally. You can see antidote-local. That's a that's a uh, an entry that's been placed in the Etsy hosts file um, for us. By the way, the self-medicate script does that also automatically, uh, and then port thirty thousand one. So, if we do search lessons, let's go to the introduction to YAML lesson. So, this is spinning up. The uh, the introduction to YAML lesson. It's a pretty simple lesson. The reason I brought this up is it's pretty small. It only has a Linux endpoint. It doesn't have anything uh, like a you know um, uh, like a VQFX or anything like that. So it should take very little time to spin up. Looks like we're there. Okay, perfect. So like I said, you have a, a lesson here, and that's pretty cool. Now let's say you wanted to make a change. Let's say you wanted to say like okay, uh, let's say uh, um, we <laughs> just some random change. Let's say hello before welcome. Um, Let's go to that uh, directory. So let's go to antidote and lessons and lesson 14. Yes, I have the lessons memorized. Don't judge me. 
Uh, hello and welcome. Okay, so we've made a change. Now this could be a change to an existing lesson, be a new lesson. It really doesn't matter. Any change inside the curriculum that we've been that we passed into the self-medicate um, script uh, is in play here. <clears throat> so if we do uh, a, a reload, you'll see again, we have a, a reload uh, a subcommand in the self-medicate script where we say reload antidote components. Um, this isn't just to reload the components. Again, when, when syringe starts up, it actually looks at the content um, fresh, whether or not that content's been pulled via Git or whether it's just already on the file system. And like I said, the way that we've installed Syringe within the self-medicate environment is the latter. It uses, it doesn't clone, it doesn't try to clone it in real time. It just expects that it's going to be there on the file system. And then what self-medicate does is it maps the directory appropriately so that it's there. What that means is if we want to show our changes in the in the environment, um, we really don't have to do anything other than hit this reload command. And if you see the, the code behind the scenes, that reload command, all it does is it just deletes the syringe pod and Kubernetes will start a new one. So it's, it's actually really simple. That's all it does. And it also waits, by the way, to make sure that any existing lessons are terminated. And then it shows you reload complete. So if we do uh, self-medicate reload, and uh, I'll load another terminal window, actually, so we can kind of ground wall. Uh, ooh, way too, way too big. <laughs> so if we do a kubectl get pods, oh, there we go. So so uh, syringe has been restarted. You can see it's only 13 seconds old. And we do a kubectl get uh, namespace. You can see that the old lesson namespace that we were running is being terminated. That's what we're waiting on over here in this, in this pane. The self-medicate script's waiting for that. Looks like it's been finished. Yep, there we go. The, the namespace is gone. So now, when we refresh this page, it will then reload a new copy of the lesson. Now, normally this doesn't happen. Normally the lesson stays around for 30 seconds if you haven't used it. But because we've deleted the, the syringe pod, it's killed any existing lessons. Um, and so that's why we're reloading it here. But once it's reloaded, you can see that our changes are here. You'll notice that I didn't do anything with git. Like I have yet to run a git command. Like so the whole workflow before of having to add files to a Git repository, commit them and, and push them, and then, and then before you even get started, having to deal with like making sure that your Kubernetes manifests are edited so that they're pointing to your repos instead of you know, the NRE learning organization, like none of that applies anymore. Um, it's all done with the local file system. So you just simply edit the files in your text editor of choice, as we did just now uh, with this, and you run reload and self-medicate handles the rest. So that's really cool. That saves a lot of time and a lot of complexity. And then there's one more feature that I want to talk about. It's not super new, but again, we've sort of made enhancements across the board. Uh, if let's say you're obviously um, this is running a, a little hot because uh, lessons can take a few, uh, quite a few resources. So it's actually uh, we, what we do is we actually configure Minikube to allocate eight gigs of RAM to the um, Kubernetes VM. So as you can see, my RAM usage is, is pretty high. Let's say I'm done developing lesson content, and I just kind of want to put a pause on things. Um, you got to be careful about this because again, if you do, if you do, if you actually delete the environment, and you can do this if you run, if you know Minikube, which I would advise that you learn enough about Minikube because um, it's always useful to be able to troubleshoot when things do go wrong. But uh, um, if you were to go behind the scenes and say like Minikube that will actually delete the entire Kubernetes installation. Now you could absolutely recreate it very seamlessly in the same way you did initially by running self-medicate.sh space uh, start. Um, but it would then, it would obviously then re-download everything. So it would take actually quite a bit. Um, depending, obviously this totally depends on your internet connection, um, but this can take, you know, upwards of like half hour even. Um, so what would be awesome is if you could just have, you know, only do this once and don't, uh, um, you know, don't, don't delete the Minikube environment, just, just stop it. So that's what uh, the subcommands stop and resume allow us to do. So the stop command is actually really easy. If we just uh, go to the stop uh, function here, all it does is it runs Minikube stop. So not, 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 nothing too complicated there. But the resume, the resume command we added, because again, every time we start, uh, Minikube, we want to make sure that all of these um, these parameters 
that Minikube, uh, that are optional for Minikube, we actually want these to be set. We want to make sure we have a decent amount of CPU allocated. We have a decent amount of RAM allocated. Um, we absolutely must have CNI enabled because that's actually, that's actually how lesson uh, networking works today. And then, of course, we want our directory mounting. So all of that stuff, we want to make sure we have um, whenever we start Minikube. And so if you use the resume subcommand, meaning if you, if you literally type, uh, oops, if you literally type uh, self-medicate, uh, resume, then it will uh, automatically pass that in. So you don't have to worry about those parameters yourself. You just type resume. Hmm, that's awesome. So that's it. Um, like I said, uh, there, there are two pull requests. I'll, I'll end with this. If you want to monitor and make sure uh, the uh, see when the changes are actually going to get merged, um, the two pull requests that you want to monitor are is this one. This is the main one. This is where the self-medicate changes actually take place. So this is where the script is actually getting modified to support everything we've talked about today. So definitely uh, go ahead and watch this, this uh, pull request. And when it's merged, you should be able to do everything that we just talked about today. Uh, the second one is over on the Antidote uh, repo proper. So let's take that self-medicate out. And pull requests. And... Uh, uh, this pull request here, uh, 188. Uh, this pull request is a, is changes to the documentation to, to uh, properly describe everything that we've talked about today. And there's quite a few changes uh, here as well. Um, and so if you just want to wait for everything to get you know finished and stabilized, then watch these two pull requests. And when they get merged, you should be able to do everything we talked about today. Wow, man, that's, that's a lot of work. Thanks for uh, for doing this. I, this is definitely going to make things easier. As someone who has used the old one, uh, this this will make things a lot easier. So, yeah, I mean, like this is like this is the thing. It, this is the environment by which people contribute. Like, if we truly want this to be a community, and, we, and both of us obviously we know this. This is true. Yeah. We have to take these barriers out of the equation, just like we took barriers out of the equation for people that are learning network automation, like the platform itself does that. We also have to start reducing the barriers for folks that are actually bringing content in. Um, so that's, that's why we did this. We wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, has the ability to contribute with as few barriers as possible. Nice. I like it. Uh, so, so we, uh, anyone that's uh, watching, you know, uh, the best way to get started with this is just is just go to the website and download it. Um, you do have to put VirtualBox in in place first. Uh, I recommend a, a laptop with, you know, 16 gigs of RAM if that's if you have that. If it's you can run it on 8 gigs of RAM. Some of the lessons, uh, lots of lessons can be created in 8 gigs of RAM or less. But if you want to use the virtual QFXs um, that we have uh, in our repository now, um, those those are not memory friendly container <laughs> images. So, uh, you know, it's definitely recommended 16 gigs of RAM and, you know, four cores would be good on your, on your laptop, um, as well. That would help, um, if you intend on using those particular images anyway, um, and, and just get started, you know, just download it, try to run it, um, you know, uh, try to just use one of the existing lessons as a sort of template and, and you and hack your way through it. It's, it's actually very easy to do. I would say the most tedious part is actually making Docker container images. If you plan to do that from from scratch for your lesson, that can be that can be somewhat somewhat tedious. Um, and you know what? We'll do a twist stream on that in the future, actually. Come yeah, it's a good idea. It. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you need to be able to do that. Sometimes you don't. Like a lot of times, it, it, uh, the, we have a utility image that has a lot of stuff installed. It's sort of our junk drawer image, if you will. So if you just want to run a script, usually everything you need is going to be in there. So you might have to create an image, you might not. Sweet. Um, all right. So, what else we got for it? What do we? What else we got today, man? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I've been uh, taking it a little easier the past uh, week or so. Um, a lot of these changes I made uh, the week before. Um, I'm taking it a little easier this week because uh, my wife and newborn child are going on a trip next week. And uh, so I'm helping out around the house a little bit. I got some traveling to do this week, um, but next week I will be uh, I will be unencumbered <laughs> by by uh, obligations. And so my hope is that uh, next week we'll be able to do the very next release for NRE Labs. And I'm really excited about that for a few reasons. The main reason of which 
I just finished reviewing a, a new lesson by our good friend, David G. Those in the network automation community have undoubtedly seen his work. Uh, he works for us, for Juniper, not for us. Like he, like we're not his like, like boss or anything, but like he works uh, for uh, Juniper um, over in EMEA. And uh, he has built this amazing lesson on using It's not just um, so actually, for those that don't know Terraform, it's an infrastructure as code tool. I won't go down that rabbit hole. It's an infrastructure as code tool. And generally speaking, it, it's mostly used for being able to configure cloud environments. Um, so usually it's not talked of in network automation circles, but there's not really a good reason for that because it's an awesome tool and it can be used for a lot of really cool stuff in networking. The problem is there hasn't been a lot of integrations built to date. Like I said, most of the integrations that exist are for cloud providers. So David uh, not only built a lesson to talk about Terraform, but he also is working on a provider to integrate Terraform with Junos and be able to dynamically create in the same way that you do this with crowd, uh, cloud resources, um, configurations within Junos without having to deal with like text files of like, you know, Junos config templates and things like that. It's all done using the HCL language with, uh, with Terraform, which means you can integrate that with a whole bunch of other tools that already integrate with Terraform. Um, and I am, I'm pretty excited about that. I'm not gonna lie. It's a, it's a really cool lesson. Um, we're gonna get the, the HashiCorp folks to take a look at it. Maybe, the, maybe they'll contribute. I don't wanna speak for them, but we're gonna get them taking a peek at this. Um, very excited about that. And then in addition, we also have two other lessons I, need, I still need to review. I, I feel bad I haven't gotten around to it, but we have um, some awesome Juniper specific stuff from uh, Raymond Lamb, two lessons actually, one on our Juniper extension, uh, extensibility toolkit, and then another one on, uh, what's the other one he wrote? I told, I'm totally blanking on that. He just he just uh, submitted a new lesson. Um, he did? I, mean, I'm, I, must have, I was traveling, so what's... What? <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, I, I'm blanking on the, on the... I know there's... about, But he's cranking out content, which is awesome. Um, that's going to get, I'm sure, into the next release because uh, I don't have a, a ton of huge platform-related things that I absolutely must get done right now. And and right now the curriculum is more important. So I'm gonna get those merged. Um, the, only, the only other thing that I'd like to bring up is one big feature that I've been thinking about integrating with the platform. And, and now that I've, I've, had, I've had several meetings over the past two weeks that have just totally reinforced the urgency of this is the idea of having lesson collections. So we have categories where we categorize lessons into things like, well, this lesson talks a lot more about fundamentals, this lesson talks a little bit more about tools, or maybe this lesson talks about like workflows that integrate tools in a specific way. Um, we already have that. Those are like we call them categories. But there, there's an, in, there's a, there's a really compelling use case to have sort of a, a second axis to categorization. So we have like types of lessons, but then if you could like think of a horizontal category across those that allowed you to organize lessons into things like, like basically like a collection of lessons that are maybe attributed to a certain author. So maybe for instance, one of our, one of Juniper's channel partners just cranks out a bunch of lessons um, that highlights their own expertise. It would be really cool to attribute those lessons to them and provide a little bit more information so folks can learn more about that company. If you're looking at automation and you wanna know, and, and you see a company that's doing it, you probably wanna get in touch with them. Yeah. And so we, we wanna be able to highlight that. And the same thing, by the way, Juniper, we have, um, you know, we again, NRE Labs isn't meant to be a product pitch, but inevitably, just because of the way the networking industry is, we're going to have to highlight certain things that are a little more vendor specific than others. Now, we're going to take on the burden of making sure that it's not a sales pitch. Like that's sort of a content curation task on our part. But we also, at the same time, want to be very upfront about who created this content. And um, for instance, the J Snappy lesson is a great example. It's open source and we don't make money off that. So there's no, there's no real like monetary incentive for us to promote it. However, it is Juno specific. And it would be nice if you're a, if you're a learner that you know that going in. So you don't like learn everything there is to know about J Snappy and then go to implement it and realize only then that it's Juniper specific. That wouldn't be very fun. Hmm. So anyway, all of these use cases have actually come up in the past few weeks. Um, and what we're going to be doing is rolling out a new feature within the that makes all of that very explicit. Um, work in progress title, we're calling it collections. Don't know if that's going to be the long-term name, but basically we just need some sort of metadata that will describe that. Yeah. Um, and and I, think, I think that'll be useful. I think that'll be useful for people, you know, that aren't necessarily like individual contributors. If you have like a group of folks contributing lessons, they'll get their own collection. And that's, that, I think that'll help enable people to feel like they're part of a, um, a team of contributors. That, I think that'd be pretty cool. That's cool, dude. Um, so you know what, we'll, uh, we have, I'll save, um, 
a more detailed review of the changes that are upcoming in in uh, NRE Labs because uh, there is going to be uh, something significant about the next announcement um, that that we uh, the next time we talk about the updates because there's there's a you know major milestones are going to be reached uh, very soon here for the project and we'll we'll do a separate uh, Twitch stream on that. Um, uh, upcoming soon, maybe again this week. We'll announce it on Twitter. Uh, it could be next week. Who knows? Yeah, uh, we're still trying to figure out the cadence. I think we want to do two weeks, but we're not we're not gonna do like a you know we're not gonna like only do once a week. If we feel like there's something you need to know about or the community wants to get involved with, we'll we'll spin that up. And if you if you have an idea, just you know send us a, a note on Twitter. Yeah. Yep. And by the way, this will be sort of the format going forward. Um, I'm gonna host the event um and usually and we'll have guests on today was matt that was an easy guest to have he's he's the main um uh coder behind the project schmuck schmuck um but we will have uh we'll have people from ansible uh, coming on as guests uh in the upcoming weeks and uh, yeah. and other things so it's not just you know not just uh juniper folks but there will certainly be a number of juniper folks um who uh who will have as guests but um if you have any ideas of, um, as a viewer on what kind of guests you'd like to see or what kind of content you'd like us to cover around NRE Labs or network automation, uh, please, you know, just send us a message. You can uh, message us on Twitter. You can, I believe you can send us a message on Twitch. Uh, and also, we have a new Discord server, which we just started. Um, it's not fully customized yet, but um, we will be sharing an invite for that uh, any, uh, for anyone who wants to join in. Uh, That'll be the official chat channel for NRE Labs going forward. And uh, we're doing this video conference using their video conferencing tools, actually, as, as a matter of fact, right now. So, uh, and there's a reason why we chose uh, social media outlets for gamers um, uh, to do this, to, to host this event and stuff. And and that'll become, that'll unfold uh, throughout the year, but you'll see something <laughs> very cool. Uh, there's a reason why we're on Discord and Twitch. Um, yes, it's for gamers. And and, and yeah, something very cool is going to happen with NRE Lab. So. We also didn't find a lot of existing gamers and streamers that uh, really were latching on to Skype for business. Yeah, no. I mean... <laughs> I've been using Skype my whole life and I haven't latched onto it yet either. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I much prefer this platform. It's sort of optimized to do exactly this kind of thing. So I think uh, we're going to wrap up then. Uh, it's been almost an, an hour for us uh, this time around. Uh, some streams will be longer. Some streams, streams will be shorter. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Uh, check out Self-Medicate. Check out NRE Labs. Uh, tell your friends about it. And uh, follow us on Twitter, at NRE Labs. Final thanks, words, everybody. Man? Yep, thanks. Nope, that's it. All right. That's it. Take care. Good to go.